what happens when you press a key on the keyboard? So if I'm sitting at Word or something and I type in something like hello computer file, what actually happens between me hitting the H of the keyboard and the computer displaying the H on screen? So we're looking at how does the actual key press go from me physically pressing the key to the computer painting the letter on the screen. And the same applies whether we're typing into a word processor or whether we're playing a game or anything that's requiring user input. There's a chain which starts off with the hardware where we have a key that we're pressing. That's my finger there. And then we're going to end up in the software with the computer displaying the H on screen. How does that actually happen? What's going on between those two things? Well, I mean, the first place to start is, is how does the system actually work? And in many ways, it's no different from your light switch. I mean, what the switch is there is you've effectively got an electrical circuit and you've got a switch. And when we press the button on the thing, we close that circuit and then the current can pass through and we can get an electrical signal. Typically in a computer system of the mid eighties, for example, that'd be plus five volts. These days it's probably plus 3.3. It doesn't matter. There is a certain voltage which signals that that key has been pressed. How many different possibilities are there from a keyboard? Obviously you've got all the keys, and then you've got shift and all the keys, yep. and you've got alt and all the keys. You know, there, there are all sorts of possibilities. How, do you know how many there are in total? Um, probably, well, I mean, what was it? I think it's a PC-103 keyboard is the standard. So there's, a, there's less than 100 keys on a keyboard, roughly, if you think about it. You've got 26 letters of the alphabet, um, 10 numbers, numeric keypad, that's got another one, 16 or so on it, all the other keys. I think you're looking roughly, when you count more function keys, help, home, clear, page up, page down, shift, left shift, right shift, control, alt, delete. Theoretically, there's probably two to the hundred different possible combinations of keys you could press from none of them being pressed to all of them being pressed and all the combinations in between. But that's, that's actually a really good question because with uh, something like a Raspberry Pi, we've got input pins on or in GPIO, general purpose input output, and we can say, okay, let's build a keyboard. We want a key, we've got the A key, so well, let's connect that to an input so that when we press it, it makes that input, we can then read it. Great. There's only about 16 or so inputs on here. You're going to run out of inputs. So how do you actually handle that? You don't really want to have to connect a hundred different keys onto the keyboard, which is where the first interesting bit of our story sort of comes along, because the way that a keyboard actually lays things out. So let's take the screws off the back of this. Should have done this earlier. So because of the way these things work, you actually end up needing to screw them down pretty tightly. Otherwise you'd get to the case where keys wouldn't actually make contact with the keyboard. Right, how many screws was that? Quite a few. So you need to, I mean, the thing is, is when, we, when we turn it over, you'll see why it's so tightly held down and that you've got all these lovely little suction cup thingies that sort of sit on top of the actual mechanism so that when you press the key, these then get squashed on top of the contacts like that. So do all keyboards work like this? Um, these days they do. Sometimes they actually had physical micro switches and things. So um, the older they are, the better quality they tend to be made or things. Um, and there's different mechanisms. So you get those annoying IBM Model M's that go click, clack, click, clack, click, clack, click. I probably just started a complete flame war. Um, I like my keyboard soft and mushy. In essence, it comes down to price and what you need them for. So this is a circuit board of a keyboard from the early 90s, I imagine. So you've got some control things at the back and then this is basically the brains of the keyboard. And if we look at a particular key like this one, you can see that you've got two bits of the circuit. So if you've got one of the things over the rubber cup, then actually when it gets pressed down, you'll see that it sort of squashes down. And if you look underneath, you see there's a little black dot and that's just basically carbon and so when that touches the probably carbon on here again it completes the circuit so if you actually look at how it's connected up then you start to see some interesting things so let's have a look at this one it's got two contacts one of them here one of them here and if we follow this one we'll see that this is also connected to the same the bottom left side of this switch and the bottom left side of this switch and the bottom left side of that one and so on all the way along, we could follow this trace until we get to the last one. It actually changes to the top right for the last couple and then it ends up going into the chip 
here that controls things. The other side, we can see just a similar sort of thing. There's a connection to that one, then it comes down, there's a link connects to that one and so on. So what's actually going on here? So the way to think about this is that we have one set of wires that run vertically. I mean, they don't on the keyboard because of the physical side of things and they're just running like that. Dot, 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 dot. And then we have another set that are running horizontally across them. So effectively you're forming a grid. Now these don't connect. So there's no connection between the blue wires and the red wires, except via the switch. So there's a switch at every cross point. Yeah, exactly. So there's a switch there. And of course, when you press that switch, that does then connect the red wire to the blue wire. What happens is if we apply no voltages across here, they're all connected to ground, then we'd read nothing across the top of these or vice versa. It doesn't matter which way around you build it. Um, if on the other hand, we put a voltage on the top wire, if we then close that switch, we press that key, your five volts will be connected to the red wire and would come out of this red wire. And so we'd end up with plus five volts there because we've completed the circuit through that closed switch. If we pressed it here, then we'd get plus five volts coming out here. So if I press both of them, we'd see that. If I let go, then the voltages disappear. So the advantage of this is that we only need one wire along there and we can then detect any of these switches being pressed. So if we've got there, we can work out which one we can read them. So if we, for example, had eight of these things, we could then read them and then read that into the computer as a byte. Any one of the bits in that byte would tell us if any one of those keys were pressed. What we can then do is put a voltage on the next one. Any of the switches on here, when we close them, we could then read out there. And so the way that we get around having so many keys and not requiring a hundred inputs is we use this idea of a matrix. All the keys are laid out. So this might be Q, this might be A, that one's W, this is S, E, D, and so on. And what the computer does when it wants to read them is it cycles through applying five volts to one line, can then read which keys are pressed on that line puts five volts on the next line, can then read what keys. So it can read them all in sequence. So you, all you end up doing is reading the first line, the second line, the third line, the fourth line. You only need eight inputs, depending on how many keys you are. We said about 100, so you're going to need about 12, 13 different lines. So you cycle through each of those lines, reading in the eight keys on each one, and then you start again, and you can find out what keys are pressed you had to program that and you had to read from each thing, which is, is fine, but you're then writing software, which is constantly what we call polling the, um, polling the um, hardware to find out what's being pressed. And if you think about a keyboard, 99% of the time, you're not pressing any keys. Even if you're typing fast, you press a key and then, for as far as the computer is concerned, there's a long period of time where you're not pressing a key before you press the next one and so on. So it's relatively inefficient from the computer's point of view. So. If you look at something like the BBC Micro, they started to develop um, slightly more advanced um, keyboards which would scan it and then only tell the computer to check it when there was a key pressed. So the, the hardware in the BBC Micro is scanning through each of the lines several hundred thousand times a second. It's got a one megahertz clock which is sequencing through all the different keys on things. And if any one of them is pressed, it sends a thing, interrupts the computer and says, you need to check what key is pressed on the keyboard at which point the computer can then check what key is pressed and handle it. So you can get some speed advantages doing that. When you get to things like the PC or an Atari or an Amiga, things get even more interesting. So we're still talking hardware at the moment because as we noted on here, these tracks which form these wires here end up connecting to a chip. And the, generally on these sort of machines, these chips end up being small microcontrollers. So they're actually small computers in their own right. So your keyboard is a computer in its own right. And what that is doing, is running one single program, which is scanning the keyboard. And it's running a thing that says, okay, you've pressed a key. I'm gonna send a message over a serial link to the computer to say, this key has been pressed. And then when they let go of it, I'll send another one to say this key's been released. So actually on a PC, on a Atari or something, you don't have to check what keys are being pressed because, and see, do all the hardware side of things yourself because actually the hardware is intelligent enough. In fact, on the Atari, it was called the intelligent keyboard to do all these things uh, itself. And so you just get a message coming down a, a specific serial link saying, okay, 
there's a key been pressed on the keyboard and it'll give you what's called a scan code so you don't get a on most modern keyboards you probably won't get an ASCII character code or a Unicode character you did some people some of the earlier keyboards were ASCII keyboards you press keys and you get the ASCII character code out of it these you get what tends to be called a scan code which is literally just the location of where the key was scanned on things so you might for example have Q being 1 W maybe 2, A maybe 30, 13, whatever it is, and so on. And you then have to translate them into the character codes you need. And the advantage of that is that if you've got different localizations of the keyboard, so rather than having a UK keyboard, perhaps you've got a Swedish keyboard, like the one there, where you've got keys in different places, so the quality is the same, but you've got some of the accented characters, you've got less than and greater than in a different location. Whether you've got a hash character or a pound sign on the keyboard, a dollar or a euro and things, that just, just becomes the software. The actual keyboards are the same, you've just got different key tops and then the software says, okay, I'm gonna map this physical key to this character code, makes things easier. So where we've got to, well, we've seen roughly how we get to the hardware and then how we get that as a signal into the computer in which, as we said, we've got a serial line, whether that's over USB, PS2, a specialist protocol, Bluetooth, whatever it is, SPI, however the keyboard's connected, and there's various different mechanisms depending on what sort of computer you're using or even just how you've built it. So you've got this message coming through and that has to interrupt the CPU to say, hey, this event has happened in the real world you need to handle this. And so the CPU will stop whatever it's doing, whatever program's running and say, okay, I've got to handle this hardware event because if it leaves it too long, well, you might press another key or something else might come along like a network packet or a hard disk data being transferred. So it has to handle it pretty much done in there. At that point, you're crossing the divide from the hardware side of things into what's happening to the software. You need to look at what the operating system is going to do. The device driver's in there to pass this message that a key's been pressed up into the application or the game that you're running, whether that's Microsoft Word, Quake, or whatever it is that you're doing. And I should caveat this by saying I'm going to be talking in general terms. Each operating system, whether that's Windows, Linux, Mac OS, iOS, BSD, insert your favorite operating system here that you probably